Hello, welcome. Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, it's not quite yet noon um, by my clock. So, and we're, we have a lot of interest in today's cafe. Um, we have folks coming in from the waiting room. Um, so we will hold just a moment or two um, before we get started, but we have a lot to cover today. So we'll hold just a moment or two, but thank you for being here and welcome. Welcome everybody. Hello, thank you for being here. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes, um, but you are here at the Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, Green Vision Initiative Protecting Healthy Water Cafe. Um, if that's not where you expected to be on Zoom, um, please feel free to let us know and we can maybe help you out, but that is where we are um, for today's cafe through Chicago Wilderness Alliance. We're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. We have a lot of folks coming in from the waiting room. Um, and it's only just now one minute after 12. Welcome everyone. Maybe just a minute longer. Thank you for being here today. And Laura, if you do you mind making Natalie um, a co-host, she can help let people in too. I would be happy to. Great. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just about a minute. Thank you, Natalie. Welcome everyone, thank you for being here. This is the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Protecting Healthy Water Initiative Cafe. I think we'll, it's just about a good time to get started. It's a couple minutes after 12. So thank you for being here, um, sharing your lunchtime with us on this Tuesday, the first full day of spring um, um, here. And we're glad to have all of you with us. There's still some folks coming in. Um, and so we'll just sort of slowly ease our way into getting started. But you are here today, if you're just joining us with the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Green Vision Initiative, Protecting Healthy Water Cafe. We have a lot of great content to share with you today. We have a lot of guests. Um, we're gonna have a robust session. So I don't wanna take too much time here at the top. But if you do have any technical difficulties today, um, please do feel free to reach out to Laura Riley um, from Chicago Wilderness, who is who is helping to administer the call. Also, Natalie Citro, you will see from Bold Bison. Um, she can also help with any sort of technical difficulties. I am Brandon Hayes with Bold Bison um, Communications and Consulting. And we've been working with the Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, this year to, with the team leads of the various green initiatives, um, to think about sort of what is the sort of exciting piece of work for each of those initiatives to move forward here in 2023. We are thrilled um, to welcome you to this cafe today for the Protecting Healthy Water Initiative. Um, if you are if this is the first time you've joined a cafe with Chicago Wilderness, a special thank you for being here. Um, and we would love to get you more involved with this initiative or other initiatives. If you signed up because you, for this, you know, onto the list because you went to Congress in November, welcome to. And for those of you who have been involved in the work of Chicago Wilderness for a long, long time, welcome today too. Thank you for being with us. Um, we have a great lineup this afternoon, uh, but be, and before I turn it over to to sort of our primary hosts for today, Matthew Santagata and Laura Barcusen from Open Lands, I want to just share a little bit about the Green Vision Initiatives and the Protecting Healthy Water Initiative, um, just to sort of set the context for today, particularly because we do have some folks who may be new to Chicago Wilderness and the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. So the Chicago Wilderness Alliance, in looking toward a vision to 2030, has established 
seven green vision initiatives, sort of important pieces of interconnected work for creating a healthy, vibrant landscape in think in terms of conservation around the four state region that comprises the Chicago Wilderness region. So of course, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. Um, today's cafe is focusing on protecting healthy water. Um, there have been also been cafes around some of the another the other initiatives like managing healthy landscapes and taking climate action. We do plan to do a full cycle of all of the initiatives um, in this early part of 2023. So please do um, get on the email list, to watch you know, for, for announcements around those other cafe initiatives. And when I turn it over to Matthew and Laura here in a moment, they'll be able to talk about sort of next steps around this particular initiative and its work. But to give you a very broad overview of that work, the goal for protecting healthy water um, that the partner organizations that comprise this alliance across the four state region will be able to access a regionalized baseline index to contribute to and comprehensively manage improvements to watershed health with the goal of supporting partners in protecting, maintaining, and restoring 30% 30, 30 of their freshwater aquatic environments by 2030. And creating that regionalized baseline index, sort of thinking about how we know what we know, is the through line and the theme of today's cafe. So it'll be a great way to dive in and think about how do we know what we know about water? And what motivates us in protecting healthy water, of course, is how integral it is to our entire region. That it's not just about conserving land, it's not just about thinking about species in a vacuum, it's not just thinking about the impacts of climate change. All of those are pulled together, are tied together. Water flows through all of those initiatives. It is a key and prominent um, player in terms of thinking about how we are going to you know, conserve a healthy Chicago wilderness region. We'll get much more into the details, but I just wanted to offer this sort of quick overview that this, that this initiative, Protecting Healthy Water, is one of seven interconnected initiatives that the Chicago Wilderness Alliance has identified for moving toward a green vision for our region by 2030. And with that very brief introduction, and again, if you are having technical difficulties, you can you can um, reach out to Laura Riley, who's here on the call, or Natalie Citro, they'll be able to help you out. Um, and also one other note about how we're going to proceed today, um, there's gonna be a lot of lively, dense conversation, a lot of great presentations. And so what we would ask is, if you have questions as we're moving through, feel free to share them in the chat. And also, if you know the answer to that, or, or someone who isn't speaking at the moment is able to answer that question or address that question, go ahead and do that. We would love to have sort of a robust conversation going on in the chat in addition to what we're able to hear from our speakers and presenters and speak as questions um, into the main room today. So we would love to kind of have that conversation going on multiple levels um, because we only have an hour. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Barcusen. Thank you, Brandon. I'm Laura Barcuse, and I am a uh, Blue Ways Director at Open Lands, and I'm now a co-chair of the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Healthy Water uh, Initiative. So thanks for attending the cafe, everyone. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, just briefly an overview of what to expect from our hour. Let me see if I can share my screen. OK. All right. Um, so, um, so I am going to begin by laying out the initiative work for 2023. And then um, Matthew Santagada, who is Open Lands Regional Planning Manager and also a co chair of this group, is then going to discuss work that's already been done by the Healthy Water Initiative group members. Um, and after that, we're gonna hear from three speakers from whom we can learn as we work towards our goal, uh, our goals for Chicago Wilderness Healthy Water. Um, since we're tasked with developing or adapting a regionalized index that will help us understand waterway health and help us develop consensus around waterway priorities, we're gonna be hearing from some speakers who can inform us on this topic. Um, I'm really excited that we have these speakers here today. And we're gonna to begin with Andrew Somar from Cadmus Group, 
um, who's going to be speaking about US EPA's Healthy Watershed Index. This is an index that we're considering for use for Chicago Wilderness Alliance Healthy Water. And Andrew was the technical lead on developing this index. And he's going to discuss with us what it is and how it can be used. Then we're also going to hear from Pamela Toshner, who is a water resources manager from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And she's going to tell us how Wisconsin has customized this US EPA Healthy Watershed Index for use in their state and how they engage stakeholders in that process. Um, finally, we're going to hear from Jacob Fincher, who's executive director of Sweetwater, a nonprofit with the mission of restoring the greater Milwaukee watersheds to conditions that are healthy for swimming and fishing. And Jacob's going to discuss how Sweetwater has worked with regional partners around setting and meeting watershed goals. So I think this is all going to be very relevant um, and help get us thinking about what we are trying to accomplish this year. Oops, I think I forgot to put this in presenter mode. Sorry about that. Let's see if I got it now. There we go. Um, so what is the work for 2023? Um, so our work this year is to adopt or choose how to customize a regionalized index that will help us understand waterway health and help us develop consensus and priorities. We're going to decide whether US EPA Healthy Watershed Index measures the indicators that are important to us. And we're also going to be thinking about and discussing how an index can inform our work as a region, how an index can inform the work of Chicago Wilderness Alliance partners and members. And we'll be forming subcommittees to look at the US EPA Healthy Watershed Index and consider such things as its policy implications whether we can use it to create a report on the state of the region that would be useful to us. And, um, and we'll be having Healthy Water Initiative meetings taking place throughout 2023 um, in April, July, and October. So US EPA's Healthy Watershed Index is made up of many indicators that can indicate the health of watersheds. The Field Museum has included the index in map form on the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Hub under Tools for the Healthy Water Initiative. So you can see the index for Chicago Wilderness Region here as it appears on the hub with the darker colors indicating the healthier watersheds. In this screenshot, you can see some of the metrics that make up the index such as percent agriculture and hydric soils in the watershed. And you can click on any watershed in this map on the hub and pull up information about the um, metrics that have gone into its score in the index. In terms of how the index might be used, one thing that we could possibly do as a group is look at its policy implications and use it to build consensus around policy work. For example, this area that you see highlighted in the light blue is um, both showing up as a high quality watershed and is also in the area where the South Suburban Airport has been, um, has been uh, proposed. Um, so the implication here is that as a group, we could look at this area um, with the knowledge that it's going to need to be protected. Uh, the desire for an index that can build consensus within Chicago wilderness is actually not new. Almost 25 years ago, an index was created to prioritize watersheds in six Illinois Chicago wilderness counties. And this was done uh, for the biodiversity recovery plan and it's published in the plan. It was based on the presence of um, species of concern in waterways and also on the index of biotic integrity, which is calculated by looking at the number and types of fish that you find in waterways. Um, and uh, that indicates stream or river health. 
And uh, so this index was used to group watersheds into categories for protection, restoration, rehabilitation, and enhancement with goals that included building consensus within Chicago wilderness for the work. So on the left, you can see the map of the prioritization from this earlier index with the really dark areas indicating the highest priority watersheds and the white areas indicating the second highest. Um, and uh, then on the right, you can see the US EPA healthy watershed index with the area that's covered in the earlier index outlined with that blue um, outline. And you can see immediately that some of the areas that were seen as high quality in the um, older index, like particularly if you look at this little spur of Will County, are also showing up as high quality in the, um, in the US EPA Healthy Watersheds Index. And you can also clearly see the difference in the area covered with the Healthy Watershed Index offering a standardized index across the entire Chicago wilderness region. So at this point, I'm actually going to pass the conversation to Matthew Santagata, who's going to talk about the work that's been done um, by the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Healthy Water Group participants to date. So I will stop my share. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Let me share my screen here. And again, my name is Matthew Santagata. I'm the Regional Planning Manager with Open Lands. I'm joined behind me by my, my furry intern, Ash. So I know Brandon has already covered this. I'm going to be discussing our initial work uh, with the second half of this message, the goal, um, Chicago Wilderness Alliance partner organizations across the four state region will be able to access a regionalized baseline index. Work couldn't begin on the index before we defined watershed health. What are we looking to measure with our index? How do you take something as complex and essential as watershed health and distill it and categorize it in a way that facilitates analysis? So again, we, we look towards the uh, preliminary healthy watershed assessment, which as Laura mentioned, is an EPA program that scores watershed health and vulnerabilities at an ecoregion scale to help identify and protect healthy waters. Um, and this is the framework that the healthy watershed assessment uses. Um, these scores are based on a template with very similar priorities to our own. So it made sense to, to use them as the groundwork for our own priorities. They identify essential ecological attributes that support healthy ecosystems. So using this as a template, we worked to identify our own watershed health needs and priorities. Uh, through this process, we, we ran across a few challenges in defining priorities for the Chicago wilderness ecoregion. Notably, you know, there are multiple agencies across the four states and they all have very independent and divergent priorities. Uh, there's a, a plethora of work being done. However, it's very decentralized and met with varying approaches. Despite how decentralized the work is, it's it's all inherently interrelated. And while the full range of work supporting watershed health is arguably all essential, capacity and funding is unequally allocated. So we, using this template, came up with our own watershed health priorities, uh, six of which we identified that would form the foundation of the index and the lens through which we viewed our metrics. These are connectivity, uh, improved connectivity of water so people and wildlife can travel and thrive, physical integrity, shorelines, riverbanks, in-stream habitat, flow, wetland preservation, connected floodplains, land use practices, uh, health, humans and native aquatic life flourish with clean ground and surface water, biological integrity, healthy habitat, and controlled invasive species, 
resilience, humans and aquatic life adapt to climate change impacts and fluctuating lake levels, source protection, uh, headwater streams, bends, springs, wetlands, and connected uplands are monitored, protected, and restored. Uh, and lastly, restored absorption. So nature-based solutions, including restoration, increased storage, and infiltration. Overall, these are looking to balance specificity in objectives with our more general values. And now that we knew what we wanted to measure, we could then consider the metrics themselves and how they reflected each priority. Uh, there were a few guiding principles we tried to uphold when considering metrics. Uh, so redundancy as a benefit, uh, placing extra value on indicators that reflect several health areas, current conditions. We want indicators that only measure the current condition of ecosystems, uh, no scores based on hypothesized states or successional trends. Ease of collection, we want variables that can be measured quickly without special equipment or training and a quantitative approach, so no subjective categories. We began by casting a wide net and surveying members to see what metrics they thought were suitable given their own knowledge and experience. Uh, this included data sets that are already exist uh, that are being uh, monitored by other agencies and organizations, uh, but also considering kind of like a wish list of data that we would like to see captured. And as you can imagine, given the scope of the Chicago Wilderness Alliance and the, the broad and deep knowledge base of its members, we had a, a lot of suggestions uh, this actually isn't the, the complete list. This is just what I could fit on the screen. More than could be reasonably measured. Um, however, the, the process really allowed us to take a deep dive into each priority and consider aspects and synergies that might have been missed. Um, this process led to a new set of questions regarding the viability of certain metrics, uh, notably the, the feasibility of collection, is an agency already maintaining this data? If not, which members have the capacity and resources to help maintain it? Uh, is special training or equipment required, or can we just use volunteers? The regularity of collection, we knew that we wanted to use the index to create annual reports. So do each of these metrics make sense to consider annually? Is it even possible to measure certain metrics annually? Uh, how often are organizations collecting this data? those dates often ranged wildly. Uh, relevancy, is this data relevant for the entire ecoregion or only a portion? We have highly urbanized, suburbanized, rural environments to consider. So what's relevant in rural Indiana might not necessarily be relevant to downtown Chicago. So how do we make sure that this data is facilitating the work of members? or telling us something useful across all four states. And relating to that, sometimes it was difficult to avoid biases in the available data. Uh, so typically more funding and capacity for data collection could be found in the higher urbanized areas, uh, which tended to pull the conversation away from rural and suburban places. Uh, so now beginning to refine this list of metrics, we again returned to the uh, healthy watershed assessment and looked at case studies for the successful development and rollout of watershed health indices at a regional scale. Uh, so we turned to our neighbors in Wisconsin who tailored the EPA healthy watershed assessment to their own region. Uh, so next up, you'll be hearing a bit about that process and how the resulting index has been used to serve their local communities. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm as a uh, introduction. I'm Andrew Somor. I'm with the Cadmus Group, a consulting firm. I'm a uh, hydrologist and consultant uh, to US EPA, um, and was one of the technical leads on this uh, pre preliminary healthy watersheds assessment. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction to the, the EPA healthy watersheds program. Um, so Healthy Watersheds was launched about 15 years ago with the recognition that 
uh, active protection of, of high quality waters is just as important as restoring degraded waters. Um, protecting healthy waters can be more cost effective and efficient compared to restoring impaired waters. Um, and it also helps to maintain those uh, important ecological services like flood control and recreation that have uh, you know, major economic and cultural benefits to surrounding communities. Uh, the EPA Healthy Watersheds Programs program has released a lot of great information to assist uh, states and local groups with watershed protection. Um, so that includes the Watershed Protection Guide highlighted at the bottom of the screen, which was released last year, um, that's tar targeted toward land trusts and, and related conservation organizations. Uh, so a key part of EPA's vision for watershed protection involves assessing watershed health to target and prioritize high quality locations for conservation activities. Um, because these assessments can be complex and, and time consuming, EPA uh, developed and, and released the National Preliminary Healthy Watersheds Assessment or the PHWA uh, to offer a starting point for protection planning. And so the PHWA puts a score on the health and vulnerability of every watershed, uh, subwatershed across the, the lower 48 states. Um, health and vulnerability scores are assigned to what are called 12 digit subwatersheds or HUC 12s from the National Watershed Boundary Data Set. You see the graphic on the right here illustrates how the water, watershed boundary data set is organized geographically. So you have these nested levels of, of subwatersheds that get smaller and smaller until the the HUC-12 scale um, on the bottom. There are about 80,000 HUCs nationally, and each one covers an average area of about 30 square miles. Um, you'll note that we called, EPA called this a preliminary assessment, and that's because uh, they expected it would fit some users' needs off the shelf, but other users might be interested in customizing the assessment with uh, state-specific or local data. And you'll hear an example of Wisconsin's customized assessment uh, after this presentation. The watershed health scores were assigned to HUC-12 subwatersheds based on a number of different GIS layers and other data sets. The data were analyzed uh, to calculate 20 watershed health indi indicators for every HUC-12 across the six overarching categories that, that Matthew intro introduced, so landscape condition, hydrology, geomorphology, habitat, biology, and water quality. Um, the individual indicators, that's the blue block boxes on this slide, uh, those measure things like natural land cover, wetlands, impervious cover, uh, impaired waters, biological condition ratings, et cetera. Uh, so choosing indicators of watershed health was, was definitely one of the big challenges for this project. Um, you know, we were obviously guided by those six overarching categories, but then uh, EPA had piloted a few statewide health assessments um, uh, prior to this project. And so those statewide assessments did uh, really offer a nice starting point for indicator selections. Um, the indicators listed on the previous slide, those are all rolled up, uh, averaged into an overall watershed health index score. Uh, the watershed health index is, again, is that overall watershed health score that's assigned to every HUC-12 uh, subwatershed. And, and the math behind the watershed health index uses a relative scoring approach, uh, kind of algorithm that, that considers the best and worst possible conditions across the group of assessed HUCs. Um, and so to account for variation in, in, in watershed conditions across the nation, uh, we set up the assessment so that HUCs were only scored relative to other HUCs in their state. So for example, uh, HUCs in Illinois would only be scored against other Illinois HUCs. Uh, but we, we recognize that many organizations do work across state lines. And so to try to accommodate those situations, we also calculated a set of uh, health scores with those HUC, HUC groupings by ecoregion. So the example ecoregional scores for HUCs in the Chicago area are, are shown on the right here. Uh, you might notice that the same HUC might look a little better or a little worse, depending on whether you're viewing the state scores on the left or the ecoregional scores on the right. And that's a reflection of that relative scoring approach that was, was used for the assessment. Um, this slide illustrates how the PHWA data could be factored into strategic protection planning. Right? So there's kind of this two-stage approach displayed here that first involves identifying high-priority HUC-12s of interest or, or kind of that larger subwatershed of interest. 
and then completing a more detailed follow-up analysis and looking at more site-specific data, local data in Priority Hux to validate their significance as, as high quality and assess risks and, and plan specific protection actions. And so the Watershed Health Index really helps with that first stage on the left by highlighting those potential high quality hucks. And, and using a house, housing analogy, the, the Watershed Health Index would help with picking out the best neighborhood for more in-depth reviews, whereas more, more local and, and site-specific data would, would help with choosing a specific house. Um, also, the for watershed protection work that's already underway, the, water, the Watershed Health Index can provide context for whether that work is supporting healthy areas in an otherwise degraded HUC or supporting a, a high quality HUC. Uh, watershed Health Index scores can be viewed and accessed in a, a few different ways. Um, so one option is through EPA's uh, How's My Waterway website, right? So you can type in a location of interest and then go over to the protect tab um, and turn on, uh, toggle on the watershed health index scores. Um, you can also um, go to the EPA's Healthy Watersheds Program page and download uh, the full Excel data file that, that has all of the different indicator values and, and all of the different index scores. Um, and then there also have been um, EPA has a few other handful of other watershed comparison tools, such as the rec recovery potential screening tool, um, where the, the PHWA and, and watershed health index has been in integrated into those two. Um, and, and I'll just uh, lastly plug the EPA Healthy Watersheds Program website again. They have a lot of great information um, about the PHWA itself, but also watershed health assessments in general, um, and also great information on benefits and, and strategies for protecting uh, healthy waters. And so with that, I will pass it along to Pamela from Wisconsin DNR uh, to talk about the Wisconsin assessment. Andrew, we did have a question if the data in the index is from 2021 or if what's the most current update? Yeah, so the, the data was originally calculated and released in 2017. And then we did do an update um, in 2021, we, we noticed that a number of the data layers that went into that in those index scores, uh, they had released updated versions of those data sets. And so uh, we updated those numbers again in 2021 and, and released those in 2021. So some, uh, the, the actual data sources kind of have a mix of in, in terms of the release date of the original data. Um, all of those data sources are, are you know documented. You can find out more in that, that Excel file that I, I pointed you to. Um, but yeah, most, most recent update was in 2021. It looks like we also have a question about whether there is a, um, a way for a user to submit data on a watershed basis. We can't hear you, Andrew. Thanks. Uh, we have not factored like a interactive data sharing into the, the PHWA. Um, so no, that's that's not currently a feature. Okay, should I go ahead and get started? Yes, thank you. And, and people can see my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, and I appreciate going after Andrew because he was tremendously helpful to us at Wisconsin DNR as we were working through our current statewide water resources protection program. Um, it's called Healthy Watersheds, High Quality Waters. A long acronym we use sometimes is HWHQW. Recognizing that can be a mouthful, though, we've also branded it as the wonderful waters of Wisconsin, which is a little more palatable to uh, the general public, public at least. Uh, before I dive into things, I just want to acknowledge our team that has been working on this for um, about three years. 
Um, we got together in 2019 and we dove into the modeling and assessment and the action planning. There's actually one person missing from this picture, Luke Beringer, who ended up going to work for CADMIS, um, providing technical assistance on the modeling work. Um, he was instrumental in, in our accomplishment. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the modeling and assessment. I also want to share some of the strategies that we put out there and a little bit on our partner involvement and discussion groups that led us to where we are now. Um, and I'll just mention that we have sort of officially pivoted to implementation and we're working through that as we speak. Um, the current action plan goes through 2030. So um, it was mentioned earlier by Matthew, this idea of de definitions. Our team's first charge essentially was how do we define healthy watershed? How do we define a high quality water? And we landed on the EPA's definition, which Andrew just shared for a healthy watershed. And you can see it there and within the healthy watershed model itself, that natural land cover is really a key driver of the model itself, um, which bears out in science that the more natural land cover you have, the healthier um, water quality is and the more habitat for fish and wildlife communities. Um, as far as high quality waters, we took, we have like a modeling step and then we have a more empirical monitoring piece, which is how we defined high quality waters. Um, basically a lake stream or river had a meet two of the bullet points you see here on this list. Um, so it had to be a unique or rare resource that could be like a trout water, wild rice water, uh, water bodies that are in existing state natural areas. It needed to attain state water quality standards per the Clean Water Act, and or it had to have good to excellent biotic integrity as measured by a bi biological index. So again, high quality waters are monitored water bodies, um, and often they have some special resource classification or designation. We also were very deliberate about including wetlands and we did that a couple ways. One way is by including wetlands in our high quality waters assessment. Um, so wetlands that are unique or those with least disturbed reference conditions are considered high quality. Uh, we've lost about half of our wetlands on the landscape in Wisconsin through historic land use changes. As far as the modeling and assessment, these are the results for the healthy watershed modeling. And as Andrew described, we use the EPA's preliminary healthy watershed assessment package. We made a few changes. We dropped out, there was a mining indicator. Um, we dropped that out because it's not um, a major threat, at least for most of the state of Wisconsin. And then we added five wetland functional value indicators. Um, so there were six of those bins that Andrew shared. I think four of them, we added wetland functional value um, indicators. And we also added an indicator to the biology bin that was based on predicted um, Hilsenhoff biotic integrity index values. So the predicted macroinvertebrate communities we might see in the streams in the given watershed. Um, we took those preliminary results and we um, labeled them conceptual, as you can see here, and we shared them in what we call the kickoff strategy. We really wanted to engage partners and other DNR programs in this process. Uh, Wisconsin has never had a statewide water resources protection program, so it was kind of a big deal to us to um, get feedback from partners right away. And I'll just quickly walk through this image here, but on the left side are our statewide healthy watershed modeling results. And the darker the blue, the healthier the watershed. And it's not surprising that the healthiest watersheds align with our most forested parts of the state. Um, early on, we heard concern from our colleagues and partners in the public that, oh, this might just end up being an up north Wisconsin type program. Um, we took that to heart and we decide, decided to run the model also within each major drainage basin or HUC 6 um, in the state. So that middle image you see is the Rock River Basin. 
And you can see when you look at the Rock River Basin relative to the whole state, there aren't many healthy watersheds um, within it. But if you run the model just within the Rock River Basin, it's relative to the other watersheds at that scale. And we can see where the healthiest to least healthy watersheds are. And then the final step is to include high quality waters within um, the Huck 12 watersheds. So this is what we put out to public um, and partners for review. And this is kind of what we had in mind as a team um, at the early stages of creating this program. I just quickly wanted to share, we also created the maps um, and lists of high quality waters and healthy watersheds. They're all available on our website. Um, and we have a really detailed technical report about the modeling work um, and some of those indicators that we dropped or added and how we did that. So a lot of resource information is out there if you wanted to take a look. Around the same time we were working through the modeling and assessment program, um, or efforts, our internal um, strategic plan was drafted here at DNR and our Water Quality Bureau leaders identified with that, within that strategic plan that their goal number one was to create a statewide water resources protection program. So our team was thrilled because we had kind of more direction and credibility um, for the work we are doing. And we were thrilled, many of us, because for years we've invested most of our funding in restoring impaired waters when we know that protecting healthy waters is, you know, should be an equal partner. Um, and it's probably more cost effective in the long run, or it is more cost effective. The strategic plan identified the four objectives that you see there. So they're related to uh, technical assistance, program tools, funding, and awareness. And we basically just copied our internal plan and put it into that kickoff strategy for public and partner consumption too, with the same goals and the same objectives. And we put that out um, to folks and shared it in spring of 2021. And the goal was to get people thinking if Wisconsin DNR were to create a water resources protection program, what would it look like? What should we do? What shouldn't we do? What sort of success stories are out there? The next step was our partner discussion groups. Um, and like all of us, we we're kind of working through navigating the challenges of COVID. And this turned out to be a really good thing because we had to do them virtually. And our engagement and participation, I think, was much better than had we done it in person with sort of traditional partner groups. Um, we had eight virtual discussion groups with over 160 people representing 93 organizations and about 90 pages of notes, as you can see, and uh, 17 hours of recorded Zoom meetings. The questions on the right in this slide are the same questions that we had already pitched to people in that kickoff strategy I just described. So if they had looked at it, they had time to think about how they might answer it. Um, and as far as the participants, the discussion groups were broke down by like the partner interests. So you can see that listed on the bottom. We had businesses, fish, wildlife, and habitat themed discussion group, a lake river and watershed management discussion group, municipality discussion group, and then uh, a couple DNR discussion groups. Um, and some of the key themes that came out of that was, yes, let's do this. Um, another key theme we heard is when we showed those maps that I shared earlier, people wanted us to create geographic priorities. They were loud and clear that, and they acknowledged that would be difficult because somebody might be, feel left out, but they wanted more kind of specific direction um, and partnership opportunities and places on the landscape to work. I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but this is our action plan that we released in April of last year, and that we're continuing to move through with these guiding principles that we heard at the discussion groups, which is use science. Um, while we did create statewide priorities, which I'll describe, um, people wanted to be able to access the information and the modeling and assessment results in a way that they could potentially customize it for their own local needs, um, if necessary. And then a lot of support for sort of elevating protection um, to the level or at least balancing a little more um, relative to all the restoration work that gets done. So moving on, these are the priority maps that showed our um, 
that we put in the final action plan, and again, based on partner feedback, we decided we would prioritize the 30% healthiest watersheds at a statewide scale, as well as the 30% healthiest within each of those major drainage basins. So the white lines um, on that map, and this example is the Rock River. And it, it's interesting that you mentioned the 30 by 30 initiative um, for America the Beautiful, because that was also kind of in, figured into our prioritization process here. Um, this is my last slide, but just we're, we're moving into the implementation phase, as I said, and the kind of the thing that's happening the most right now is partners and other programs either taking our modeling and assessment results and integrating it into the work they do or asking us to take their um, sort of priorities and their action plans and integrate it into the work we do. So we have this mutually beneficial relationship with multiple partner groups. The example you're looking at here on the right is Landmark Conservancy, which is a land trust that does a lot of work in Northwest Wisconsin. We overlaid their protection priorities, which are the orange kind of polygons and where they actually have projects are the dots with our statewide geographic priorities. And you can see there's a lot of similarity. And if we were to take like the St. Croix River Basin, um, those major drainage, drainage basin priority maps, it's amazing and remarkable how well they align. Um, Southeast Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission did some initial look-see at their priority maps and it's similar too. So we're really pleased to hear that the partners think there's a lot of potential and um, resources to leverage um, and that the geographic priorities are lining up. And with that, I am done and just wanna thank you again for being here. I covered, um, there's, there's a lot more to cover but I appreciate um, the time I had and if we have qu time for questions now or later, I'm happy to answer them. There are a couple of questions in, there's a question and a comment in the chat, um, but I think in the interest of time, it, why don't we move on to our final presenter and, and Pamela, if you want to hop in the chat and answer some of those questions, we would hugely appreciate it. And thank okay. you. This was, that was thank splendid. You. Okay. Jake, um, the floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you. Just pulling up the presentation now. All right. Well, Andrew and Pamela, uh, you're talking my language, so thank you for that. I, I kind of wish my presentation got a little bit more into the, the technical side. But anyways, I'm Jake Fincher, uh, the executive director of Southeastern Wisconsin Watersheds Trust, also known as Sweetwater. Uh, we're a science-based non-advocacy organization in uh, the greater Milwaukee area, and we work with multiple engineering firms, nonprofit organizations, and 29 municipalities and counties. And I'm really happy to be here to share and learn from uh, you all around the Fresh Coast in the, in the spirit of collaboration around water quality issues. I'll talk about something most of you probably already know about, but it's a burning river in Cleveland. Uh, so I'll speed this all up, but... Cuyahoga River um, caught on fire, and in particular, the one that everyone really knows about is the one that happened in 1969. Uh, but before that, there were multiple other fires there and around the country, and uh, these polluted waterways were, were really uh, an indicator of economic success, so they were pretty much ignored, um, generally speaking, and so these Municip these uh, businesses and factories would build pipes that would go directly into these rivers untreated. So it's pretty easy for these fires to happen since there were no major rules against it. So in 1969, the river caught fire again. However, this one is uh, relatively smaller than others um, in the past. And actually, we don't even know if there's actual photos from this event. However, this story uh, picked up national attention when it was featured in Time Magazine, uh, but they miscited the dates uh, from the photos. So anyways, uh, what that led to, as we're probably all familiar with, is the Clean Water Act, which was mentioned earlier. And to be really brief, Clean Water Act essentially allows the Environmental Protection Agency 
to develop rules and regulations that the states then have to follow. And what that means here in Wisconsin is that in our administrative code, there are certain rules and regulations that the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources can enforce on local community and uh, local county and, and municipal governments. Now, a lot of really smart people came together and without going into a bunch of detail, they pointed out, you know, water pollution comes from two major sources that we can regulate uh, point source and non point source. And sounds like you all are generally familiar with that. But as you can imagine, pollutants coming from a single pipe or, or point are much easier to identify the source and regulate, whereas nine point source becomes a pretty wicked issue and becomes a lot more difficult to manage and prevent because the issue is when it rains, it falls on everywhere, everyone and everything and that water all goes downhill. So um, like I mentioned, you know, the, we, we, we thought that passing all these rules and regulations would prevent these fires on these rivers, but guess what? Again, in August 25th of 2020, not long ago at all, uh, that river caught on fire again. So it just cannot catch a break. And what happened here, is it might be a little difficult to see, but up on the top there, there's a, a plume of smoke and an accident on a roadway. And that was a fuel tanker carrying a bunch of fuel. That fuel went downhill into these storm drains and then out into the river down here, circled in blue and caught on fire yet again. So that's where Sweetwater focuses our work is on the non-point source pollution, uh, in particular, the municipal and county rules and regulations called stormwater permits. And these can vary slightly from town to town, but each one is broken into six major components of which we really focus on four of those. Uh, stormwater pollution, prevention, education, public involvement, illicit or illegal discharges, and pollution prevention. So, you know, stormwater pollution happens. Not everybody understands this process. So the so we're required to educate on it. And instead of each municipality and county creating their own education campaign and message, uh, we here in southeastern Wisconsin all support one outreach campaign, and this improves message recognition, reputation, and what really is interesting to me is the cost-saving benefits for taxpayers. Uh, EPA states that on average, the most on average, the cost uh, to do this on their own would be about five times more expensive compared to partnering with other municipalities, counties, and regional programming. And that's just the education portion. So public involvement, monitoring water quality, uh, inspection, and training municipal staff, that gets really expensive. expensive. So on, a, on an average year, we help save about $2.1 million in, in our region. And not only is there that cost-saving benefit, but we help ensure that not only are our partners compliant with the law, they go above and beyond the bare minimum and hopefully speeding up that road to recovery for our waterways. An example of some of the particular work that we're doing, uh, in addition to that respect our waters program and education and outreach, we develop uh, these things called municipal portfolios. So with the 29 permitted entities that we work with, uh, we are trying to understand them better. So we develop uh, these profiles that help us understand who's working where, what projects they want to do. Essentially, it's a little dating profile for these communities. And with that information, uh, we can really start to develop municipal and even neighborhood specific messaging that focus on particular pollutant loading areas. So we're also developing a, a suite of resources called the One Stop Shop. Uh, this is for municipal and county personnel. Uh, to help speed up that training and standardize processes and, and improve knowledge about best, best practices. And, uh, you know, they're from day one learning about water quality issues. It's all in one spot, and that helps reduce the complexity and workload for supervisors. So more recently, we started to develop our approach in a way that mirrors that federal, state, and local hierarchy that I talked about. Uh, meaning we work with 29 municipalities and counties 
And we're trying to reach out to other organizations throughout the state, and that's actually been pretty successful. Uh, that might be doing similar things. And as a state, we learn from one another, but also we are acting as a state representative to the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance. So we're getting uh, information, we're learning from our peers and then from the state and then even on a national level. And that all helps us to inform our jobs to make sure that uh, our communities are not only compliant, but they're going above and beyond. And uh, lastly, this all got started because we started to go to these municipalities who, again, have an overwhelming amount of work on their plate. You got to remember that they're, they're, the EPA tells them what to do. The states then tell uh, the municipalities and counties and who's responsible for all of that. It's, it's the staff working at these municipalities and counties. So on top of everything else that they have to do, they have to meet these pretty complicated and, and sometimes confusing regulations. So if we can remove some of that burden, help make their jobs easier, save taxpayers money, and again, go above and beyond the, the bare minimum to protect our waterways, we're gonna do that. So if you're interested in learning more about our work um, or our 90 element plans that we developed, watershed restoration plans, or a multi-million dollar projects happening here in the Milwaukee area called an Area of Concern or AOC, agricultural work, green infrastructure implementation and maintenance improvements. Uh, or if you wanna start your own regional program, um, more than happy to, to help and, and reach out. So thank you. I know that was pretty brief, but I just didn't wanna cover some information you already knew. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, thanks so much to everybody um, who's spoken. I I feel like I really learned a lot. Um, I think I just have one more slide to show about next. If I can pull that up. Um, oops. Let's see here. So, um, so our next steps uh, in terms of uh, the Healthy Waters Initiative is that we are going to be having a meeting of our larger group, which you all are invited to join. Um, the meeting is going to be on Thursday, April 27th at 11 a.m., and it will be virtual. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the US EPA Preliminary Healthy Watersheds Index and whether it covers what we think needs to be covered for our region. Um, thinking about how the index can inform our work as a region. And then thinking about the formation of subcommittees to take a deeper look at the index um, in terms of what we think its policy implications might be whether we think we can use it to create sort of a state of the region report. Um, so those will be our next steps and we hope you all will be able to join us on April 27th. Uh, and I believe that after this cafe, you will get a link to the meeting on April 27th, as well as other resources that have been presented here. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody um, for joining us uh, for this um, Healthy Water Cafe through the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. Um, if you have not signed up for the Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, newsletter um, in the past, we'll be able to add all of your information um, into that um, from registering for today's cafe. Um, and, and Matthew and Laura, are you willing to share your email addresses should folks want to reach out and have questions about getting involved in the work between now and and the meeting um, not to put you on the spot but but it might be great if you all were willing to share your contact information um, in case folks have any questions absolutely please feel free to reach out with questions comments anything at all 
Excellent. And a huge thank you again um, to our guests and all the amazing information that you shared from Wisconsin and the amazing work that's going on there. And um, like we mentioned, we will you'll receive the slide decks um, if you attended the meeting and registered for today's meeting um, sometime this week, I assume. And it looks like we are just about done with one minute to spare. So thank you all for for uh, your brief and lively and and data filled presentations. And we look forward to seeing folks at the next Chicago Wilderness Alliance Cafe. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.